Okay, it looks like everybody's settled, so we'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, 2.45. My name is Warner Losh. I work at Netflix, and I'll be talking to you today about DevMatch. This is a program that I wrote to gravel through the kernel modules and figure out which one of them match uh, devices we have in our dev tree that don't currently match anything and load the drivers. So we'll talk about all that. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of trivia to get started. Does anybody know how big the first edition, or at least the first edition we have of PDP-11 Unix kernel was? 10,000 In terms of uh, object code. No, it was 9K. <laughs> yeah, it was just bigger than 9K. <laughs> That'll fit into a lot of things now. Um, that was back when uh, memory was, I think they had a PO for $100,000 to get the, the 16K, or the 8K word, 16K byte memory card. How big is FreeBSG? FreeBSD uh, i386 11.1 generic kernel. 27 megs, that's the closest. It's 24 meg, almost, just under. <clears throat> so how fast has the FreeBSD kernel grown? Year over year as a percentage since the beginning of the project. I hear 5%. Anything else? Three. Three. Uh, it's about 20% a year. How large was it in the first one then? First one was about 500K, 534K. <laughs> right, FreeBSD 1.0. I didn't go back and look at the patch kit images. That's a missing data point. That's a very good point. I have not even started with my talk, and I'm missing things. But that's why I have you around. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about why I did this today. Um, and I went back and looked at the kernel size over time to see if the kernels keep growing. Um, spoiler alert, they do. Um, and then after I go through that, which I think might be interesting to people, I'll give a background on the different pieces of the system that I had to touch to implement DevMatch. And then I'll go through the design of DevMatch and do a walkthrough of the changes I made, or at least some of them in brief. And I'll give a little bit of a report about the problems encountered. And I'll show you the results of how small I was able to create a uh, kernel that would work. So my main motivation for this work is generic has gotten absolutely Huge. It's you know it's grown from half a meg to 26 meg um, in current, and um, it takes a while for this to, to build. And I'm impatient, so I uh, want to make it smaller so it build times are faster. Because we're already building, we're building the kernel twice. We build all these modules and then we build uh, the kernel. Why do, you know we it's going to work together anyway most of the time for most of the testing I need to do. Why, have to, why do we have to build everything? Um, as the kernel's gotten bigger, so is load time. If you're trying to net boot something, it's getting a much slower, and having a smaller generic would help for that. Um, another thing right now is third-party modules. Um, the integration is a little uneven, and it would be nice if you install a module on your system if it just worked by default. And if it has the plug and play information and you have that hardware, DevMatch will load it. And um, I've always wanted to do this because I thought it would be a really cool feature to have. Linux has had this feature for a long time. Um, it's implemented in kind of a, a different way than what I did. Uh, but it's just something I've really wanted to do. So the kernel size. Um, kernel size growth has been exponential for a very long time. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. There are a lot more drivers now than there used to be. FreeBSD has about 1,700 drivers in it right now. 
Yes, some of them are obsolete and we could delete. That's not the topic for this talk. Uh, it's a topic for another time um, when I have a baseball bat, uh, perhaps. Uh, just as a precaution. I'm not physically going to harm anybody. <laughs> um, and there's a bit of proliferation of, of um, technologies. Uh, version 7 Unix didn't really have networking. Yes, there was a packet packing interface in it that you could use, but TCP IP wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, and now we have TCP stacks and SATA stacks and SCSI stacks and uh, IPv6 and IPsec and crypto and the list just goes on and on and on. And this is a partial list that I have up here. Um, I didn't have enough room on my slide to include all the technologies we have little stacks for. Also, um, compiler writers have discovered that if you aggressively inline, the code runs faster. So that's also contributed to the bloat. Um, so if we look at research Unix, um, it was originally, for those who don't know, um, done on the PDP-11. Um, the first few versions of, of Unix were limited to 16K because that's all that the, the C compiler at the time could produce. In order to break the 16K barrier, they had to improve the C compiler so that it could generate larger images. Um, the size of the kernel that they had was uh, constrained because, like I had said earlier, the uh, memory modules were like $100,000 for a 16 or an 8K word module. Um, and, you know, you need to have, you can use a little bit of that for the kernel and a little bit, you have to have some left for the user. The user, the kernel can't use all that. Uh, as such, the systems were very static. So there wasn't a g concept of a generic kernel. So I just picked uh, one that was uniform over the series of data points. You compiled the kernel you won, and you put it on the hardware, because you didn't have a lot of machines, and there wasn't a lot of distribution, and the bootstrapping was a little complicated, because you had to fast forward to the right tape mark sometimes and load the right kernel to get everything to work, but generally there wasn't a generic kernel. I included data points from the BSD2 series of releases. There were just a few. Um, and uh, System 5 and uh, System 3. Uh, so over the 30 years of releases that this spanned, um, the kernel growth rate was about 15% um, a year, and the early part of this was, was faster, almost 30% a year. Um, I got all my data from uh, the Unix Historical Society, twos.org, which is a good place to go to look for old copies of old Unix if you ne ever need one. Um, and we see there's two phases here. The initial phase of let's do a whole bunch of work where it grew from 8K, 9K, up to about 56K. And then the slower, well, we're in kind of a maintenance mode um, as it grew over time. And uh, <clears throat> through the different Berkeley and um, USL releases. There was only one System 5 release. There is no SVR2 or SVR3 for, for PDP-11. They, they dropped it by that time. And so I was wondering, well, okay, so that's one set of data points that showed exponential growth. Maybe that's unique. So I looked at the VAX releases, because that's another long-lived series that everybody's familiar with. I started with 32V um, and went through the latest NetBSD release I could find. And the growth rate's about the same, 10 or 15 percent a year. Um, and the initial part here, 32V was a swapping kernel, not a paging kernel. Um, 3BSD, I believe, added swapping, or added paging. By the time we get to 4BSD, we have all the network stuff added. So again, we see this pattern of initially a high growth and then kind of a plateau that, uh, in this case, has lasted about the last 30 years. So we get to 380, I-386. Maybe FreeBSD is different, I thought. Um, I was wrong. Um, FreeBSD has also grown as well. Um, I've not tried to isolate um, whether the, all these things are due to additional modules or drivers or new technology or anything. I just took the current or the even compiler effects. I just took the um, uh, kernel sizes stripped 
uh, out of the uh, release um, images that I could find online and came up with this graph. And again, we see initial, the first part, we have a, a, a rapid growth until we got to about 3.0, and then the growth rate slows down. S but we're still seeing an, an exponential growth rate because this is a, all the slides have been logarithmic. You know, it's a power of two for each division further up, a doubling in size. Um, <clears throat> so no, FreeBSD is not any different. And if you look at uh, uh, this graph, these are the three different slides I just showed you presented in a different way where all the sizes are normalized and it's a percentage growth or a growth factor. Um, the red, or sorry, the blue and the green lines are the PDP-11 and the VAX, and they're about the same. And you'll, the red data is from FreeBSD, and we're growing a little faster even than the historical averages. So that's concerning. But if you look, there must be a lot more commits in FreeBSD, I thought. No, this is the number of commits that we've had going back to the beginning of the project. I have a more complicated version of this slide that I um, share from time to time on Twitter. Um, the blue line is the trend line, and then the red line is the actual numbers. This is a linear scale now, so we have a nice linear progression. It's not we're committing more code or we're doing more changes. It's, it's um, the fact that the changes are bigger, the drivers are bigger, the technology that the drivers rest on is bigger. Um, you know, this just shows the, um, a similar thing. It's not quite as fast as Moore's Law in terms of the doubling, uh, but it's still very concerning because there's a lot of indication Moore's Law isn't happening anymore. So we need to do something uh, about the growth of the kernel size, otherwise we'll be growing faster than Moore's Law and eventually we'll have a problem, particularly since it's exponential growth. So switching gears a little bit, um, I need to, that went one too many. I need to give a background on the pieces I touched. Obviously, I'm touching new bus because that's where the, you know, it's the drivers and that's where the, all the plug and play data that we have for the project lives. I'm touching modules because I'm loading modules. Um, I leverage off the module system, so I modified KLDX ref, and then I added the glue to the system to uh, allow it to automatically happen on boot or when devices were added to the system. So new bus, for people that don't know, it's a hierarchical bus. And each of the buses supply the plug and play information. Plug and play is kind of the old ISA add-in card term for, you know, you just plug it in and it works because you're able to look at the card and enumerate it without having special knowledge of jumpers and um, address settings and IRQs and all of that. Um, we adapted the term years ago. It's fallen out of fashion in the industry, but since that's what's in the code, that's what my talk will be using. The work, focus of the work is also on self-enumerating buses, buses that know which devices are there. Um, if you are trying to hint devices into the kernel, um, that, there's no real um, way to know whether the device is there or not without running the probe routine. And we can't run the probe routine without loading the module. And so we'd have to load all the hinted modules. And we have a bunch of hints for things we know aren't there kind of as fallback. So I just left the hinted buses alone, the buses where we have to configure that. So this will be self-enumerating buses. And um, generally speaking, the FreeBSD model is that we uh, split device initialization into two pieces. We have a probe routine that bids on the device, looks at the plug and play information for the bus and say, oh yeah, I recognize that card, that's mine. I bid however much. Um, or, oh, I recognize that class of card, I'll bid a little bit less and if nobody else bids me, I'll take it. Uh, and um, sounds nice and abstract, but uh, over time we have a number of different buses and they do different things. Some of them have a nice centralized routine you can call, you pass it a standardized table, you call the routine, you get it back, your probe is really small. Others, other buses have uh, decided not to do this or weren't, they didn't do this in the original days. PCI is one. And so every PCI driver 
had to write this on an ad hoc basis. So there's a lot more diversity uh, in those drivers. And the design couldn't just say, well, all buses, all drivers of this bus have this information. It had to account for these wildly varying uh, tables that are in our drivers. So that's an important thing to remember for later. This is just a device tree. The important part here is the PCI bus has a lot of children. Um, the PCI bus populates each of these children with a generic node and then calls the probe routine for each of the PCI drivers to ask if it's yours or not. This is a typical probe routine that is less bad than others for the RAL driver. Um, and the important part here is there's a table and a loop that goes through the table and finds it and returns uh, information. Um, here's an example of a bad routine that's much harder to fit into the thing. This is from the NVMe driver, which is very recent. The first part looks really good. See if it's in my device table. And then, but also it checks the device class and sees if it, if it is something it recognizes. Um, and that's a little bit more problematic because this is two different ways that the driver can attach. So that's another area that the design had to encompass. There's a, then we have a crazy probe. This is a very old driver. It's from the Tulip driver. And it checks the vendor ID. And if it's not deck, it returns. And if it's the sub-vendor isn't this thing, it returns because there were T1 cards that were made using this chip in a different mode. And it had to filter it out. And then if it's a particular chip ID, it sets the name and returns the, hey, this is my card. Um, there's no table here. It's all in raw code. So something different has to be done for this driver. It's not going to be a simple one-line change like my design goal uh, for all the other drivers. If you look at the previous drivers, hey, there's a table here we can tag and maybe do something extra. There's a table here we can tag. But in this, there's no table. Um, so the driver or the modules that we have in the system, every driver is a module, and we record a number of metadata. What does this driver attach to? What version is the driver? What does it depend on? That uh, module system has been there for a long time. Uh, the bootloader knows how to read this stuff in and deal with it. It's tied into the sysinits to probe when you load a device. It's very well integrated into the system. And all of this metadata, uh, when you do a install kernel and you're not cross-compiling, is processed. It looks at all the KOs that were just installed and runs KLDXREF to create a um, linker hits file that is kind of the key to a lot of the stuff I'm doing. This is just an example. You, this module depends on um, uh, PCI and the firmware interface. And it's a Waveland driver, so there's a couple of other things. And then it's a, it attaches to PCI. Um, KLDXREF, like I've said, takes all of the metadata that we put into the KOs and generates the hints file so that uh, we can more quickly load uh, the appropriate driver, given a name. Uh, usually, this is run at install kernel time, uh, unless you're cross-building. And we, uh, that's one of the reasons we also now let you run it at boot. If you're building an ARM64 image on an AMD64 box, you can't create the proper hints file. So we just create it at boot now on, on that platform. This is kind of a simplified data flow for what I just said. You have the driver, you build it, it has the module information going into the KO. Um, we install it into boot kernel and run KLDXREF to create the linker hints. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, we have an RC system that uh, and it runs to bring the system up. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that. There's uh, other places that people are talking about um, rc.d and other uh, alternatives. Um, the code for this is fairly simple. It'll fit into any system that we have. DevD is a program I wrote 
years ago that reacts to uh, events in the kernel that happen. And one of these events is I discovered a device that I don't have a driver match for. And so uh, the DevD uh, find, gets this device from the kernel and does things for it. And I hook into that later to run a script to uh, try to dynamically load a mouse if you plug a mouse, a UMS driver if you plug the mouse in. So I showed you the data flow before, and here's um, another version of it. The things in blue are the areas I changed. I added the um, PMP module info, which I'll talk about the format of here in a second. I changed KLDXREF to parse it and simplify it. I wrote devmatch, which takes the linker hints and looks at the, the device tree for the system that is in place and produces a list of modules to load. You can run it in a couple of other modes for debugging or to find which modules that have attached on the system don't have findable plug and play information. So you can maybe find some missing uh, modules that uh, wouldn't automatically load but, but should. Because if you're using the device, chances are other people are using the device as well. So as you recall from the section on new bus, each of the drivers have a, have a table in it. So the design is that we will mark this table in a way that can be interpreted outside of the driver. We'll extend KLDXREF to save these markings, these decorations of the driver. Um, and we'll write a program to do the matching, called, uh, which is called devmatch, which is the title of the sock. One of the things we need to do, in addition to the stuff I've talked about, um, there's some extensions to new bus. Uh, that are needed for when you're loading multiple modules, and I'll explain why that's necessary in a minute. Modules are special in FreeBSD. They have full generic locking rather than the specific locking that is in the kernel, so there's a small penalty for locking, and the atomics are not inlined, so there's a small penalty for atomics. Um, the exact extent to how much slower modules are, um, I've gotten estimates that vary from I can't measure it to, I don't know, it should be something by logic, but I, I haven't seen any real numbers on that. There's some things we can do that are easy that will uh, fix some of the module penalty, and I'll talk a little bit about those later. And finally, the, the last step in all of this is I created a minimal kernel years ago that didn't have any drivers in it, um, and that needs to be tuned a little bit. There are some drivers you can't put in this right now, or that you can't have automatically loaded. And we need to have a conversation of ways that we can transition to having a leaner generic. So the plug and play information assumes we have a table. 90% um, of the drivers in the system have a table, probably 95. A few don't. We need to, in order for an external program to go look at this, we need to describe how big each table entry is because drivers have um, plug and play information and maybe some other stuff that says this is the version of the chip to use, use these quirks for this particular board, what have you. We need to be able to accommodate that because those are usually in one table and we don't want to force drivers to split that into two tables. We need to know how many entries there are because there's no real convention. Some say, oh, some pass a count to the routines that match or know how many uh, entries there are. Others just have a sentinel at the end. And then we need to figure out what the format of the entry is so that we can interpret it outside of the kernel. So to do all of this, it leverages the existing module system where we already record this information. I did that to have a smooth transition. The last thing I want is to have big, have to require all the drivers to have big changes. Um, we have 1,700 drivers. We're not going to have big changes in all of the drivers. That's just a non-starter. Some of the buses are fortunately have a centralized probe routine, USB, PC card, um, and uh, have the routine. So we can provide a macro for those 
um, which makes converting them very easy. I did all the USB and PC card drivers in a day. Um, it's taken significantly longer than that to push this into the rest of the system. So I don't want to go into this in a huge amount of detail, but each um, driver or each driver table gets marked with um, a little meta language that has a type and a field name that matches the field name in the plug and play info. If you do a dev info minus v on your system, one of the things it prints is PNP info and a whole bunch of key value pairs. And those, those are the names that match the names here. Uh, and I'll get into what some of the cryptic stuff means, but as you might guess, U16 is uh, two byte uh, unsigned uh, quantity that um, we can pull out, and Z is a string. And the hash sign is just for a comment. You know, this is here, it's a placeholder, you have to skip over it to find the information that's needed. Um, I don't want to talk about all of these fields. Um, you can read the slide. Uh, one of the interesting ones is you know, PCI has basically two ways that people do device tables. One is to have a vendor column and a device column and maybe other columns. And the other is to combine the two into a, a, a word. The first case is really easy because that's the information that the PCI bus publishes. But the second case is harder because on big Indian machines it's stored one way and on little Indian machines it's stored another. So we have to tag those specially with W32, which has the two different fields, so that depending on the byte order, they, the proper values can be extracted. <clears throat> so for a centralized probe routine, this is all the change that's needed to make the UARC driver work, is to add this one line. Um, it's a host info, and there's the table. And you know, this one I chose because it was one of the few drivers that just had one line. I could put this whole thing up on the screen and it would fit. <clears throat> but there are other drivers that have, you know, tables that look like this. This is one of the PCI drivers that has the vendor and device field encoded this way. And there's a, a whole number of them. So for this, we have to say that the, we have to use the, the, the more raw macro that tells it, um, you know, what it is, um, where it attaches, where the table is, but also um, how many items are in the table. And there's a part that I didn't notice before that's right here that tells the table size or the entry size. I didn't notice that when I was preparing my slides. I'll have to fix that. <clears throat> so that's a, a more um, difficult thing. Now, the DE driver is the bent fork, if you're, not notice, if you're not getting that. To fix that, we basically have to rewrite it. All these lines should have pluses in front of it, but basically, you have a table now, you go through and find the right entry um, to do the matching, and then you would write this entry here. So that's the changes for that. Fortunately, there are not very many drivers like that in the tree. So, one of the things that we need to do with new bus is we need to introduce a concept of freezing and thawing the probing. If you've got multiple modules that match a particular device, uh, let's say you have a mouse, a uh, USB mouse, there's two different drivers in the system that could attach to that mouse. One is UHID, which is a, a, a generic human interaction device driver that, that attaches to a whole lot of things and understands different protocols and presents one interface. And the other is UMS, which is specialized for mice. And based on the plug and play information, you can um, figure out which one will attach. Um, but you don't know the priority. You'll, you know that both of these drivers could attach, but you don't know which one would have uh, the priority. Now you might think, oh, well, we'll just encode the priority in that table you're generating, add another argument to your macro. Well, for this example, that would work. But if you go and look at the RE and RL drivers, 
or the SK and DC drivers, you'll find there's a number of cases where the probe routine matches the same plug-and-play information, returns the same level, but has to go look at something secret or special on the card to know, oh, is this one for me or not, that isn't published by the PCI bus. And in that case, there's no way we could, that DevMatch could know and have enough information. It has to load both those drivers and hope for the best. But with the sysinants that are in the driver, we load one driver, the sysinants run. We load the other driver, the sysinants run. In the case where the tie happens, if you load the uhid driver first, it wins. The umouse driver comes up, oh, there's no unattached devices, I'm not going to do anything. It doesn't try to rebid or do anything like that. So to get around this problem, we need to say, hey, I know I'm going to be loading a bunch of drivers. Um, don't do any probe and attaching for a, little, for a little bit. Any probe and attaching that comes in, put in a list to defer for later. And so we freeze pl plug and play, we load the drivers that we need to, or the modules that we need to, and then we thaw plug and play. And then all the drivers attach, they have a chance to bid, um, we handle both of the cases, and the system can go on. One of the areas I didn't try to do is when we load multiple drivers, I don't try to figure out which one attached and then unload the other ones. Um, that's a, a fairly rare case and an optimization that I, I don't think is worth making, but perhaps others do. So one of the big things I had to do to make this all work was modify KLD XREF uh, to parse this new plug and play information. And one of the things I, I had hoped to accomplish was we've got all, you know, we had a very complicated table of the language that um, we had to understand, but I wanted to simplify that so that we had a, a simpler table that we could more easily uh, match things with. So the simplified language I came up with is, is much simpler. Everything's an int, so we upcast to an int. Um, there's a couple of types where uh, FF means ignore, and so all the FFs get widened out to minus one uh, so that we can ignore. Um, and we just have a few types so that we could put this code that interprets this in the bootloader where we have a resource constrained environment in addition to devmatch. I've not done the bootloader yet, but I designed it so that we potentially could in the future. <clears throat> So devmatch, is, as I've said already, parses the linker hits, um, uses dev info, live dev info to get the information from the, the kernel, matches up the unattached devices, uh, and prints out a list in its default mode. And there's a couple other things you can do. You can dump the linker hits file to debug it. Um, you can look at all the devices in the system to see what matches um, to make sure that things are matching up like you think. Um, and also look for devices in the system that have um, an attachment but don't have a plug and play marking. Um, one of the interesting things about this is you can take the linker hints from generic and put it on a system that has no modules and then run devmatch and point it at this file and it will tell you which modules you need to then copy over to that system. It's completely, once it hits the linker hits file, it's completely decoupled from all of the loadable modules, um, which is useful if you're trying to bring up a new system or you have um, a nano BSD situation where you're trying to keep things really small and you can't put all of the drivers on to run a test to see which ones it would load. There's another mode where um, rather than parse the whole kernel tree every time a new uh, device shows up, you can just hand it the no match string that comes from the kernel, and that's where uh, that's what the mode it operates in when we run from devd. Um, we have a simple dev match RC script that uh, freezes the bus, loads the K, runs dev match to find the KOs to load, and then thaws the bus, and everything works from there. And then the DevMatch script um, leverages off of uh, DevD. To, when there's a no-match event, it just runs the RC script. Now, um, this might not be so good 
not, may, very, might not be very future-proof. Um, this wouldn't work in an open RC environment, so I'll have to change that to using service. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that right as I put the slide up, I should have changed it and committed it while I was preparing these slides, but it's an imperfect world uh, that we live in. I had no idea it would be so talked about at this conference. Um, so the next thing we need to do is look at a minimal kernel. You know, none of this is any good with the current generic because everything's in generic. Well, if we look at a minimal kernel, what kind of minimal kernel do we need to make this work? Well, you need root in order to load the devices. So you can't load the devices for root with this mechanism. We could enhance the boot loader so that it would load um, all storage devices, but sometimes you can know that and sometimes you can't. In PCI land, there are all storage drivers are a particular class, so you could load that. Although there might be a few uh, false positives with RAID controllers that didn't quite follow the PCI standard. Maybe they're not relevant to what we're doing, but they're out in the wild because every weird thing in the PCI land that can go wrong has gone wrong on at least one RAID controller. <clears throat> Scott's not laughing. He's like, yep. <laughs> and I had to deal with every single one. Um, so we could put that into the bootloader, and it's probably useful to put in the bootloader because we can find the common cases. We can find NVMe. We can find AHCI. We can find MPT, uh, MPR, MPS, those drivers. Um, we can maybe even ro uh, load uh, SDHCI. Um, but then you go, well, what if I have a USB root? Well, you, then you can't do that through the bootloader, or you need to tell the bootloader you have to load USB, because USB isn't a storage device. It's a USB device. And do we speculatively load it because it might possibly have storage on it, or do we not because we don't, the loading things from the loader is a little slower than loading things in user land, and we'd rather wait till we have user land to load it. I don't have a good answer for that. It's one of the reasons I've not tried to implement this in the bootloader yet. Um, another class of devices, so let's say I load MPT. I also need to load CAM, otherwise there'll be nothing for MPT to attach to. Fortunately, most of the time the dependencies are listed um, I didn't audit all the dependencies, and I'll bet there's at least one that's missing. Um, USB doesn't depend on that. We'd have to look at the USB bus and see if we find a UMass and go from there. UMass depends on it, though. So the other thing that you can't load at all from the bootloader is console drivers. Console drivers have to be compiled into the kernel right now. This is non-negotiable. There is no way around this. Um, the console is initialized before the kernel goes off and looks to find the metadata that the loader left that tells it where all of the modules are to link in. So there's, if you, you can load the driver, it'll act like a driver. Um, you load um, the UART driver, for example. It'll act like a UART driver. It just will never, ever be the console because it's not there at the time it needs to be there. So um, this just notes that linker hints is also read by the bootloader. I've talked about this slide. I'll move on. There's a Google Summer of Code project this year. Um, I have a very good student, Lankan Kenny Reddy, who is adding uh, markings to all the PCI drivers that we have in the system. There's about 380 of them in the system right now. Um, I will acknowledge that some of them are obsolete and should be removed. Again, that's a conversation for a different venue. Um, he's going through the ones that are in the tree, and if we remove them before he gets to them, he'll not do them, and if not, he'll just keep cranking through. Probably 300 of them are entirely table-driven, so all that you need to do is figure out the right little syntax to write and write it and check it out and make sure it matches. Um, there's maybe 50 more that are close, like the NVMe driver that I showed you, where there's some additional quirk or twist that you need to deal with. 
Um, one common example is like for the NCR driver, it checks to see if it's um, a NCR vendor ID and then it checks this big table of uh, device IDs. So the NCR vendor ID is not in the table. So you would need to modify the table so that it's in there so that dev match can match with it. I might, this is a common enough case, I might extend the language a little bit to be able to put something that says, assume that this field in the um, plug and play information is uh, this particular value when you're looking for devices. Um, and then there's 30 others that are like the tulip driver. They're just crazy. They're, um, some of them are very ad hoc. There's, they, there are no tables at all, a bunch of case statements. Um, you know, take this number and this number and mask them together. And if it's one of these three numbers, then attach the device. Um, we probably can turn all of that into table driven. Some of the masking stuff we'll need to look at maybe extending this for as well. I had no idea. I thought I knew all the drivers in the tree really well, and I had no idea this stuff existed before my summer of code students said, well, what about this driver? It's like, I've never heard of that driver. Wow, that's crazy. You're right. <laughs> that is just insane. Why would they do that? So clearly, um, several of these were written a long time ago and are likely candidates. So I'm having him do those last because um, maybe Never <laughs> on some of them. Um, so there were a, a couple of problems. The first one was um, lingering in the system for a long time. USB creates this huge string that's like 200 characters long for plug and play information. But the interface to get information out of the kernel was, a, was fixed strings of 128 bytes. So it didn't fit, it truncated. And this was a, uh, the truncated string didn't match any of the driver's um, plug and play information. So keyboards weren't loaded, mice weren't loaded. Um, and I had no clue until problem reports started rolling in that this was going on. It took a little while to figure this out. <clears throat> um, I changed the kernel library interface so that it exports this as just, uh, you have a 4K buffer and you use the strings however you use the strings. You don't try to, um, you know, you don't reserve space for each of the individual fields. So it's a lot like the string table in the old a.out uh, executable files. But I was lucky. Um, Mike Smith designed things such that uh, the live dev info interface had pointers to this internal structure. So I could then, well, I can malloc the stuff and have pointers, and there's no change, no user visible change. So I didn't have to bump the uh, I didn't have to bump the library version number. So one of the one of the problems that um, I came across fairly early on is the IOAT driver. Um, there's a, a DMA assist engine that's in newer. Intel uh, CPUs that lets you do DMA, and there's like six of them or eight of them on your on at least the systems I had, and so we would try to load that driver eight times. The first time it would load and everything would probe, and then the second time it would load and say it's already loaded, and the third time it, you know, and so I would get a lot of noise at saying this is already loaded. The solution was to sort and uniqueify the list of modules to load, but the U mouse U hit issue that I've been t referring to. Um, we had to partially back that out. Um, Hans put in a kludge that knew what more specific and less specific was for USB and sorted things based on that um, in the dev match. Uh, or, and I'm looking forward to removing that code when we get the freeze and thaw into the system because I, I did not like it and I did not react well to it. <clears throat> Let's just say. Um, uh, so this is, this is the slide for the UHID UMS problem. Um, we need to have freeze and thaw to make it work. Um, there are a lot of legacy drivers. We have a GSOC student working on the PCI ones. They're the most relevant for uh, the project because 
Our machines have PCI and PCIe. Um, we have about 40 of those done. One is, uh, three have been committed. Um, the other 40 will get committed uh, once the talk is done. I've been focused on my talk and not pushing his stuff in. He's getting a little antsy, and I need to um, throw him a bone, particularly since next week is the evaluation period. It's like, are you happy with my work? You haven't pushed it in, but you haven't said anything. So, no, we're happy. We're just busy. Um, so the FDT drivers in, uh, for ARM64 and other ARMs, we have 384 FDT drivers, and maybe six of them are marked. Um, if you want to help, find me afterwards. I'll drop everything and help you on the spot um, because uh, we don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the bandwidth to do this. I thought I might. Most of these are table-driven. A few aren't. So it's not a, as bad a mess as PCI was, but it's not something that I can just sit down and go into brain dead mode and crank through in a day. So I talked about the module penalty that we encountered. Um, I'm still looking for anybody that has reliable information on um, how doing something in the kernel versus doing something as a module affects things. So if you have that, I'd be interested to know. Uh, Two of the easy ones are the, um, we should go ahead and inline the locking uh, and maybe look at why we have the different cases for the driver. I believe it's because the um, old UP versus MP kernels used to be a thing, but now if we always build MP kernels, then maybe we don't need modules that can deal with UP. So we need to look at that. We can inline the atomics, and that'll get rid of a lot of the penalty. Um, the pick penalty, we put up with anyway for shared libraries, so maybe it's not a, such a big deal to move to this. But it is one of the things that, as we roll this out and slim down generic and have more modules loaded, we'll have to be mindful of um, and, and keep an eye out on the mailing lists to make sure that there are no regressions. Does anybody know the answer? Yes, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the record, Jonathan says, uh, the long dead hen of the past has not ungripped them yet, and we should just... We should, no, 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 we should throw the dead hand away, not honor it, and uh, make them be inlined. Right? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, as part of the, as part of the continual tuning, we need to make them be whatever's appropriate and not force them to be one or the other and have the kernel and the module treated the same. And if it gets inlined because it's better, we'll do it the same both places is, is going to be the solution for that. Okay. Okay, so the old ATA PCI driver. Um, I had totally forgotten that this existed and I thought it was gone from the kernel, but my student asked me about it. The PCI bus publishes instead of class, subclass, and re revision ID as three separate fields. It puts them all into one field and just calls it class. Um, and the ATA driver matches the first two, the class and subclass, and then uses the rev ID to figure out a bunch of things. It's not a, oh, this is revision one or revision two or revision three of the spec. It's, well, a bit field, and it's this funky thing if this bit is set. It's that funky thing if that bit's set. And there's this extra register over here if this bit is set. And all the bits are valid, and so we would need like 256 entries in order to cover them all. Um, <clears throat> so we probably need to do some kind of masking. If we do masking for this, we can do masking for the other crazy PCI drivers that um, are in the tree that have 
uh, a mask component to them. But you know, it's, it's how do you match up the mask to the thing that's masked that might be a little bit tricky. So uh, that we haven't done that yet. Um, that's, we're putting this towards the end as well. Um, so these are the things that aren't done yet. Um, I'm not going to go over it in a whole lot of detail because I've talked about all of these points. Um, this is where we're at. Um, so the parts of the talk that aren't these are done. And then these are in process right now. So I bet you're wondering, well, did it matter? What did minimal turn out to be? Can anybody guess how big minimal is if you, um, I did three cases. Strip out all the non-root drivers, strip out um, all the dri non-root drivers and just leave the root drivers that are popular. So just one or, you know, HCI, NVMe, and maybe one or two others, MPT. Um, and then what if you also strip out auxiliary fire systems and, mod and kernel options that could also be loaded? What do people think the, the where approximately how big do you think the kernel is if you do those things? Less <laughs> You're right. It's not 1.2 megabytes. I would love that to be the answer. Well, it's close. If you do the, the most extreme, most revert-deuced version, it, it, it is um, like six, it's, it's two-thirds. It's two-thirds savings, one-third the size. If you do just the first one where you leave all the possible root devices, including all the old crazy RAID cards and stuff, it's about half. And if you have a, a medium thing, it's in between. So this should give a range of where um, we think minimal will wind up. It's going to be somewhere in this range. And in this slide, I've, this is the same slide I showed earlier, except with gaudier colors, and it just goes back to FreeBSD 6, 7, and so forth. So the size of the kernel drops from there back to it was when we about FreeBSD 7, which is, if you look down here, about 10 years ago. I don't know. I don't know why there's a dip in 11.1. Um, I don't know if something got deleted or we had a new compiler that was better. I don't know. I had made a note to find, try to figure that out, and I don't know. We didn't, we didn't do that in, that's in current, but that's not in stable. That's only in LLD, so. So, so that's, that's the answer. I have that in a chart, you know. About half for the moderate options, and the aggressive options is you know two thirds. Um, you know, the today's kernel is 26 gig. AMD 64 with fewer drivers is 28. I, I don't know how that happens, but it's a thing. So that's the talk that I have. Are there any questions from people? Uh, Emmanuel. Yeah, I didn't find any MPT driver uh, annotated, so if you can point me at one so I can look, I can do that. I, I, I can do that later, and I will make that my number one priority probably after going to the bathroom. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Brooks. Is there a reason why KLDX ref is it crossable to crossable? Um, no. It produces ints. And ints are the same across everything. It's it's just not um, Indian friendly right now. So there's not a marking on the file that says this is big Indian or little Indian, um, and that's probably the biggest barrier. We'd have to change the format of it um, to to make it so. Or m we might be able to guess that from looking at the tag, the first few tags to see what order they're in, because the tags are stored as ints. <clears throat> but yeah, I, that was on the list of things I know I need to do, but it was below the line before the conference. Well, I was curious in part because it's, it's also the way we do it now is sort of bad. It doesn't, it doesn't fit well with the non-root build because we run it after install. And that's, awesome. that's all. Well, if we solve that problem, we can make it a cross tool. And I mean, if worst case, we can pass it the Indianness on the command line because we know that.
We used to do that for the password files. We may still do that uh, to, to solve the cross-building that way. Yes? Have you looked at other systems that whether they are doing similar things or is this the FreeBSD differentiator now? Um, Linux does this by putting all this data into a, a special ELF section. Windows and OS X have it in a separate text file or registry that describes what to load. But in both, of, I thought about doing that here as well, having this, this post-processing step just do that. But um, I was worried about multiple matches. And in uh, OS X and Windows, um, that is the uh, probe routine. You, that driver is assigned based on that information, period. There's no secondary probe in the kernel. And I thought that would be too big of a change to FreeBSD's driver model, and I didn't want to introduce that. So that's, that's the summary of the other systems. If I'd had more time for my talk, um, I would have added that. Um, but I thought, you know, that, that's a good question. I almost had a section in my talk on that. But... Um, I, I, I was worried about running way too long as it was. And um, not everybody's enjoyed my talk, so um, <laughs> I worried about the length as well. So are there other questions? That looks like no. Thank you very much. I